This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Today, I am speaking with Mallory Phillips and Nathan Dugan of Shelter Whitefish, an organization dedicated to creating housing options for low to middle income earners. Community is important. Um, and so the way that we build housing impacts that. Mallory and Nathan co-founded Shelter Whitefish in 2022. Mallory, Nathan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So tell us, where did you grow up? And what did your parents do? Mallory, let's start with you. All right. So I am actually, uh, ra- was raised in Whitefish. Mm-hmm. Um, and my mom <laughs> did a lot of eclectic things. She was, a, she's a reflexologist. She. Uh, What's a reflexologist? I have to ask. So it's a foot massage. Oh. Um, and it's the idea that your body is mapped out on the bottom of your feet almost. And then my stepdad, he is a construction consultant analysis. So it's like if something goes wrong in a construction project, uh, he gets called in. Nathan, how about you? Yes, I grew up in uh, Northeast Ohio in Mm -hmm. a city called Warren, which is 45 minutes or so away from Cleveland. Um, Moved out to Whitefish after physical therapy school in 2015. My parents uh, my mom was a kindergarten teacher for mm-hmm. most of my life. And then my dad, um, before my life, he was in the Air Force, but then he was uh, uh, an over-the-road truck driver for, for most of my life uh, okay. growing up. So the two of you are the co-founders of Shelter Whitefish. Uh, let's just start with what is the organization and why did you start it? Mallory, you want to jump in on that? Sure. So we are a 501c4 pro housing nonprofit. Um, so what that means for a 501c4, for those who don't know, is that we can do a lot more lobbying. Uh, if you donate to us, it's not tax deductible. Mm. Um, uh, but part of the reason we went that route is a little more freedom. We are not beholden to donors. Okay. Um, and the reason we started it, Nathan and I lived in Kellogg, Idaho for three years and moved back to Whitefish in 2021. Um, and we really saw how much Whitefish had changed. A lot of the people that I had become close with after graduating college and people I grew up with were being displaced left and right from rental houses, Um, many people leaving the Flathead Valley altogether. And we just didn't see a lot of people coming to city council meetings to talk about housing that actually needed housing. Um, And so we formed as a way to, originally we formed as a way to like build collective power uh, to get more voices in the room around housing. Nathan, why don't you give us a state of play for housing in the Flathead Valley and and Whitefish in particular? Yeah, I think before we started, um, it was pretty hard to build housing in Whitefish, Um, specifically if you're talking about something like an apartment complex or an apartment building, um, or I mean, anything really that's kind of more dense than single family homes. Back in 2013, one of the local developers proposed to to build something and it was gonna be partially single family homes, partially townhomes, condos, partially um, apartments. And they came through four or five iterations over the course of a year or two and um, at every meeting they just whittled the apartments down. They started off with like 100 and then 70, 50, 30, and then they just scrapped it all together. Uh, And the interesting thing was that last meeting when they got rid of the apartments, there was no opposition at all uh, to that. And now given the the state of real estate in Whitefish, it is, uh, those houses in there are probably a million dollars or so, $2 million. Mm -hmm. Whitefish is building a little bit more housing, you know, still not as much as, as we'd like to see, but there haven't been a lot of projects that have come through, to be honest. Um, Kalispell's building just a ton of housing everywhere, and that's got its own problems with just like urban, suburban sprawl. Okay. Um, and then Columbia Falls is doing a little bit as well, uh, probably a little bit less than Whitefish at this point. Your organization is focused on, in my understanding, a particular type of housing, a, a segment of the market, low to middle income earners. Right. So these are folks that are priced out of the market. And it sounds like like if a single family home is unaffordable, there's not much in terms of more dense housing options. Mallory, is that an accurate uh, state of affairs? Yeah. So um, in Whitefish specifically, really, there's single family homes and then a limited amount of condos and apartments. And there's not much in between. And 
and whitefish, there aren't a lot of options unless you're in a single family home or an apartment. Right. Um, and so that's, and, and we think that apartments are important too. That's an important part of the housing stock, but there's also very few options for people that don't want to live in those two things, or maybe can't live in a single family home, but don't want to live in an apartment. And, and what does that look like for folks in that, uh, in that part of the income distribution, I mean, are they leaving the community because they can't find housing? Are they ending up unhoused? Is there a shortage of, you know, the sorts of folks that would fill the sorts of jobs that that swath of the income distribution would occupy? What's it? What are the the pressures on those people as as they're living through this moment? During the housing needs assessment of I think last year, they found that over 57% of Whitefish's workforce now lives outside of Whitefish. Okay. Um, and as someone who grew up in Whitefish, it's, I mean, it's, you know, economically challenging in the Valley. It has been for a long time. Um, and I don't know what the stats were before, but, you know, it, a lot of times if you worked in Whitefish, you could live in Whitefish. Um, you, it may have been challenging. You may have been stretched thin, but you could do it. And now a lot of people who work in Whitefish, there's just no way with the wages versus the cost of living um, that unless you're living in overcrowded housing, it's pretty hard to do. So you're describing a situation that feels sort of stuck. I mean, the whitefish growth policy I saw on your website, it hasn't been updated since 2007. So trying to get multifamily, trying to introduce some density, some new construction at the price point that would support this type of housing, uh, it seems to be very difficult. What are some mm-hmm. of the, the barriers to that? Like what, what, is, what is causing this, this stuckness from a development standpoint? Yeah, I think it's certainly not a lack of investment dollars or a lack of people wanting to develop. It's yeah. it's more kind of on the the community and the the council and how they kind of view things. And I think that 2007 growth policy is a major impediment. It's an easy thing to cite and it's not very not very open to to rentals, renters, uh, to apartments, to things of that nature uh, kind of anywhere in Whitefish. And I guess okay. that's a lot of the discourse that we that we've heard uh, in city council and and that kind of caused us to start an organization in the first place is just the anti-renter discord and and no apartment building no matter what the affordability is um, at that time it's changed a little bit now we're, we're making a little progress but at that time like none of this stuff met the character of whitefish okay. um, and so you know take that to mean that that's like the character of Kalispell or columbia falls but it's not what we want in whitefish Nathan, you served on the governor's housing task force started in 2022 in the last legislative session. Several bills that were considered to be bipartisan and pro-housing were passed. Now there is a lawsuit trying to stop the implementation of those laws. Like, Explain the state of affairs here. Maybe we'll start with the legislation first. So some laws were passed. Your organization views those laws as good things. What are they designed to do? Why are they good? Yeah, so the bills that kind of passed through this last legislative session here in Montana, they got a lot of recognition throughout the country just because, you know, no other state has been able to pass uh, a suite covering a suite of bills covering so many so many zoning issues all yeah. at once. Were four major bills um and those are the, the bills that are currently being challenged, the laws that are currently being challenged because they were all signed into law by the governor. SB 245, which is a bill that uh, we actually were able to, to write and kind of find a sponsor for and get that. Uh, this permits mixed use and multifamily development in commercial areas throughout the state, commercial zones. That was already allowed, I think, in so, places like Missoula and, okay. and, and, and some other cities. So an adaptation of existing zoning policy, essentially. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, that bill had a parking limitation on it as well. So sure. um, you can't require more than one parking space per unit. Um, which a lot of cities, including Whitefish, were requiring that for those types of buildings. So, so that was a win there. Which is sometimes it's an unappreciated uh, blockade to building. Sometimes mm-hmm. is the number of parking spaces required, and sometimes those requirements are, are don't make a lot of sense. So that's kind of allowed a couple of developments to kind of progress in Whitefish that were stuck or not brought forward yet um, since that bill passed. So that's mm-hmm. that's been a good one in Whitefish for sure. Second bill in that suite of bills is SB 323, which is a, a duplex bill that applies to um, certain cities over a population threshold. Okay. SB 382, which is 
one that people are, are really concerned about. It's called the Montana Land Use Planning Act, and it's uh, just a rewrite of, of the planning statutes in Montana. Aims to kind of make cities quantify their housing need based on projection, projected population growth over the next 20 years, uh, and then create a plan through a growth policy to um, to accomplish that and like say where you're going to put that housing to meet that population growth should that come, adjust your zoning, that sort of thing. It shifts a lot of that process towards that growth policy phase, so towards the front end, and then if a developer comes in with a development that meets the rules on the back end, uh, then it'll just get approved, which is, you know, uh, we set the rules and and we agree as a community generally, like this is where we want to see housing. We think that's a good thing rather than uh, this neighborhood is is on average wealthier and has more time to come to meetings and they're going to shut down anything near them. And this neighborhood is not, so everything's going to get built over here, which is what we see happen in Whitefish. And I'm sure it happens in other areas of the state. Um, and then the last bill, which is shocks me that it's, it's so controversial. I don't really understand why, but it's SB 528. Uh, it's a bill that legalized accessory dwelling units um, okay. throughout the entire state. So access, accessory dwelling unit, also known as like a, a, a granny flat or a mother-in-law suite. Sure. Yep. Um, Apartment above the garage, something yeah. like that. Or even in place of the garage in the backyard. Mm -hmm. uh, could be attached to the house, could be in the basement, um, that sort of thing. So just allows people to build a, a smaller um, home on land that they already own that maybe they're not really using to house their family or to make a little bit of extra income with uh, by renting it out to somebody locally um, or to just use as you know extra space and what you see with accessory dwelling units is that they change uses over time so those laws are being challenged in court by an organization called montanans against irresponsible densification so in their name sort of is the premise like we don't want more dense density in our communities but beyond that like what is the most charitable case against these laws? Like, what is the primary argument they're making? So the primary legal argument they're making, in my opinion, is is an equal protection argument. Um, basically says that there are some people that have, live in HOAs, homeowners associations, and have private covenants that don't permit an ADU to be built or a duplex or whatever. Okay. Whereas those of us, myself included, who live in a city and don't exist within an HOA um, now are subject to these laws. And so they're making an argument um, about equal protection there. Um, you know, we think that's a pretty weak argument and, and is not really applicable. And there's a lot of reasons for that, one of which it's hard to enforce a contract that you're not a party to. And it, it would be hard to, to survey every single private covenant that exists throughout the state of Montana to determine that that is actually the case. We'll be back to my conversation with Mallory Phillips and Nathan Dugan after this short break. A New Angle is proudly presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. This show does not happen without these pillars of our community, and I'm so grateful for their support and encouragement. And speaking of support, have you checked out our new website yet? anewanglepodcast.com. There you can support our show directly with a variety of subscription options. Subscribers get access to bonus episodes, additional segments, writings, and other benefits. So check it out at anewanglepodcast.com. Hey, this is John Wicks from Deaf Charlie, and you are listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with Mallory Phillips and Nathan Dugan of Shelter Whitefish. Mallory, what is your take on this? It's sounding like folks don't want density. Uh, they just want to keep things the way they are. As somebody who grew up in Whitefish and now has had a hard time finding your own housing there, how, how do you feel about that? So I think uh, what's really important when we talk about housing issues, especially zoning, um, is we can't ignore the history of zoning. Yeah. And so for me personally, that was like a really pivotal place for me to start looking at housing in a different way, especially growing up in Whitefish. Because when you grow up in Whitefish, there is this mentality that things are going to stay the same and any threat to things staying the same, um, you come at in a really like anti-outsider perspective. And that, that in turn, like people don't like density, they don't like all sorts of things if they feel that it's a perceived threat to things staying the same. Um, and so that's kind of the mindset I grew up with. Um, but when we lived in Kellogg, Idaho, um, there was a lot of poverty, but 
most people had homes. Like mm. the cost of living was just so much lower. And moving back to Whitefish was shocking. And so um, when we started going to council meetings, we started reading books. And I read the book called The Color of Law. And it really breaks down the history of housing and how once it was no longer legal to segregate by um, race, um, things like zoning laws were used as a weapon to segregate by class, which in turn segregated by race. Um, and so in Whitefish, uh, it has been even more apparent in the last few years as Whitefish has become really wealthy um, that it's definitely becoming a weapon of um, keeping people of lower economic status out. I think that communities need to have a conversation about that. Uh, and Whitefish was a historically blue collar community that was economically very integrated. Um, and when they talk about the character of the neighborhood, which is a term that comes up a lot, the history of that term is very gross and has some pretty like classist and racist uh, history. In my opinion, the character of Whitefish historically has been that economic integration and vibrant neighborhoods in which you know your neighbor and they may not live the same life as you, um, but you get exposed to people living different lives. Um, and so that's really where I come at housing at and why I think it's so important that we re-examine how we build our neighborhoods. It's interesting how these debates play out in various areas of Montana. I mean, zoning and code are four-letter words in much of the state. And in the case of Whitefish, as you're describing it, it is, let's keep it the way it is. And in other parts of the state, it is, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to build whatever I want, wherever I want, however I want. Yet, there seems to be sort of a, a political disposition that unites those two positions. Yeah, I mean, I think that thing that unites that position, no matter like what your political affiliation is, is that Montana is one of the last states in the union to really see a lot of growth. And so there's a lot of open space and a lot of rural space. And even our cities are fairly rural or historically yeah. have been. Um, and so that's just something that people value is just that limiting sprawl. It's a difficult question to navigate, right? Because you, as you add people, it makes those amenities come under more pressure. And, and mm -hmm. you know, there are questions as to like, what is the right amount of people to have in the state? And that gets into really tricky terrain about equity and justice and all sorts of things. Well, you, you often hear an anti-density argument um, against, against density and against uh, changing zoning to allow for more density that is environmental. But um, from our perspective, the, the environmentally responsible thing to do is to develop fairly densely on sure. the infrastructure that yeah. we already have where people can walk or bike um, or public transportation networks can be built that actually work. Um, we build our cities backwards in a lot of cases throughout the country. And, uh, you know, it makes sense. The city starts out very small and everybody's got a single family home. There's not a lot of demand. Um, but then those people that are there never want that to change. And so the city uh, grows outward and then you see outer belts pop up 10 miles outside of downtown and then the apartments start getting built there. And so you put all these people where they have to drive to get to the places that they need to be rather than doing it the other way around. So aside from, you know, making the legal case and sort of advocating for your organization's objectives through that legal mechanism, where are the areas that you feel your organization sort of gains the most traction? What are the arguments that you feel bring people into the conversation and uh, they say, oh, yeah, you know, you're kind of right. Like, maybe I should be thinking differently about this. I just think for us, a lot of our work in housing comes back to community. I just think that a lot, some of the changes that we've seen in Montana and like the Flathead Valley is that we are more disconnected. We're living farther from each sure. other. Um, we're spending a lot more time in cars and we're not walking as much, um, specifically in Whitefish because it, you know, is a fairly walkable community. Mm -hmm. So is Missoula. You know, there's just less opportunities to connect with one another. Yeah. And I think that that's another shared value that uh, people, regardless of your uh, political spectrum, 
spectrum um, that you share when you live in Montana, whether you're new here or you've grown up here, is that community is important. Um, and so the way that we build housing um, impacts that. Yeah. And so we've been able to get people, including my mother, who was pretty like resistant to this stuff when we first started talking to her about it, that if you build in a way that kind of gates off parts of a community or a community as a whole, um, you lose something so vital in like trusting your neighbors in, you know, when times get tough, you, you, you're going to help them out because you've built these connections. Um, and so design of new developments are really important. And so that's been a really cool way to talk to people about this in a really human way, which I think sometimes uh, when it comes to housing and policy, we kind of get disconnected from the people. Um, and so I think that's an element that we bring to these city council meetings and community housing meetings is we try, one, we try to get people who are experiencing housing insecurity to tell their stories. Yeah. Um, because some people on these boards and on these committees haven't had to rent uh, in 30 years. And so they're pretty disconnected on some level from what it means to actually have to navigate this housing crisis. But I think there's a lot of people who have moved from other places that have never lived in community this way. Um, and they may not know how. And so the more that you can show people that where you live and how you design the cities has a a mass impact on all of us. I see it, you know, in the entire flathead, there is becoming this like distrust of other people. And I don't know that housing design is the only reason. I think it's more complex than that, but I do think it's an important element. So Nathan, back to the court cases, what are the state, what, what's the state of play right now? Yeah. So we um, filed to intervene in that case in Gallatin County District Court um, a few months ago in support of all of those bills and still waiting on a decision on that one. Two of those at the end of last year were uh, enjoined by, by the district court. And so SB 323, the duplex bill and SB 528, the ADU bill, which were scheduled to take effect on January 1st. Um, Whitefish and I think some other cities had already changed their ordinances to be compliant with those bills. And so uh, in those cities, that have kept those those ordinances around, like the bills are still in effect okay. for all intents and purposes. Um, but everywhere else, it's not, you know, the state law for those two bills doesn't really apply. Yeah. Um, the state appealed that to the Supreme Court. We filed to intervene there as well. The Supreme Court um, pretty quickly denied that motion, but they did allow us to fi file an amicus brief there. Um, just last week or two weeks ago, the district court judge uh, Maid had requested that they stay the district court case pending the outcome of the appeal on the preliminary injunction at the Supreme Court, and he did uh, uh, rule to to stay that case. So nothing's happening in the district court case right now pending that appeal at the Supreme Court of, of SB 323 and SB 528. Let's pull the lens back just a moment. Uh, Nate, we'll start with you. You served on the governor's housing task force. Yep, yes, they'll do. You're, you're, and you, you're currently a student here in our uh, master's of business administration program. Yep. Talk about the learning that you've gone through in this process of being a, an activist, interfacing with government. I don't know if I'm really a good activist. I am a good lobbyist or I'm, I'm okay. good at forming policy. And we actually have a paid lobbyist in Helena. So he does, he does all that lobbying down there, but we lobby our city council. So try not to be inflammatory anymore. We started off that way for sure. And a lot of activism can get into, uh, being a little bit more inflammatory and, you know, making people that you want to make a decision angry. Um, and we certainly value that and we need that, uh, perspective in city hall as well, because that provides a little bit more pressure than we're um, able to give as an organization. But everything that we've done has been totally brand new uh, to us. So forming a nonprofit, uh, never did that before. Yeah, Never done a state legislative session before. So that was all new and just kind of learning all the nuances that exist there, as well as it finally to intervene in the court case. So just kind of learning a lot from our, our attorney uh, there when he sends updates and uh, through reading those those legal filings, which can be quite long and, and difficult to read. But yeah, it's interesting. I guess if I just break it down, it's it's I'm building like competence in this area without really realizing it just by 
the exposure. A lot of transferable skills developing right now. Mallory, reflect on your time. What what are what are your key learnings? Well, so it's been interesting um, through this process. I've also been obtaining a master's in social yeah. work, and so a lot of it has been connected to what I'm learning um, about organizing and uh, about how you design a nonprofit that actually represents the people that you're trying to represent. And uh, so what I mean by that is we are working to get housing that is more affordable for low and middle income people. And so it's been really important for us to ensure that we have renters on our board. And so I just think that one of the biggest takeaways I've learned is that it's an evolution. Um, the way that we started, I think, worked for the time. You know, we were pissed off, and that helped fire us up and get organized. Um, and then I think also I learned, because um, sometimes I can be a very black and white thinker, is that in order to get policy made and crafted, you have to be willing to listen to people that you might not normally yes. and build bridges with people you might not normally. And then you start to, I think the really cool thing about policymaking, and this is why I think more people should be involved in policymaking, is that I think it like makes you see other people with different perspectives in a more human perspective. Um, because a lot of the rhetoric around all of these issues is very us versus them, and you stop viewing them as people that have reasons for believing what they believe. And even within Whitefish, where I sometimes get upset with some of the rhetoric that I hear, they're coming from a place, right? And I have to understand what that perspective is in order to try to create an argument that they can understand. Activism is an important lever in our society. And, and, and I applaud a lot of activists. However, the work of policy is actually where is our system for solving problems. Well, and I would even say um, something that we've talked a lot about is we need activists for the work that we yes. do. We see them as a really important part of fighting to change things is because we have this grand vision of what we want to see. And they're able to push for it in a way that helps us to work on the inside of the system to try to make change. And I think a lot of times when it comes to different topics, such as housing, there is a within the same goals that people have, sometimes activists and people working on the inside see each other as the enemy when we really see activists as a really important part of this. And we're, we're not going to be able to do the policy work that we want to do without activism. And so I think, again, it doesn't have to be one way or the other, that those, those two things can work in tandem. Just enjoyed speaking with the two of you. I wish you the best of luck, not only in your studies, but in this work as well. And as you sort of develop your life and livelihoods in the Whitefish community. Thanks for joining us today and, and telling your story. Yeah, Thanks thank you. Thanks us. for having us. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. If you like what we do and want to support us directly, please consider a subscription at anewanglepodcast.com. A New Angle is recorded at Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. Our presenting sponsors are First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Kelly Larson is our producer. Maddie Jordan is our production assistant. VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time. <laughs>